Hi, I'm Owen from REST Australia. Thanks for tuning in to the REST Network. Before we get into today's show, there are a few things we have to go over. Firstly, what you're about to hear and see is limited to general information only. It's not personal financial advice like you get from a financial planner. Also, it's important to remember that past performance is not indicative of future performance. That means that anything that's happened in the past, or we say today, is not necessarily going to reflect what happens in the future. Lastly, please consider that any of the guests or myself are featuring on this program may have a financial interest in some of the products or shares mentioned. That's enough from me. I hope you enjoyed today's program. Kate, welcome to this episode of the Australian Finance Podcast. It is wonderful to be back, Owen. Yes, it's always a pleasure to record with Emma Edwards. How are you going? I'm great. How are you? Yeah, it's always a pleasure because we get to talk about something that we're super passionate about, which is the behavior of money, people with money and psychology and all these types of fun things. You're finishing up your course at the moment, which we're just talking about. Mm. So, there's so much to get to for those folks that haven't listen to you before. You have your own podcast. You're like prolific on social media um, and you've been on the show before. So, there's plenty to go on and I'm sure we'll have links in the show notes to find all of that. But Kate, what's what are the things that we're going to be talking about today? Well, Emma, you've been talking a lot about financial psychology. I know you've been doing some fun challenges on your Instagram. So, I want to chat about that and your money spending journal because it's a different way to think about spending And even talking about some ways that we can add a bit more accountability to our goals and spending. So, maybe to kick things off, if you want to give listeners who haven't listened to your previous episode, maybe a 30-second elevator pitch to who you are. Mm. (laughs) This is the part I didn't prepare for. (laughs) Um, So, I'm Emma. I have uh, my brand is called The Broke Generation. Uh, I have my own podcast, The Broke Generation Podcast. And coming in May is Broke Business, the money podcast for business owners. Um, And I focus on the emotional and psychological side of money, which because it's behavioral, it talks a lot about spending. And it's quite a difficult thing to talk about, especially when you're talking to females, because historically, money commentary for women has always been about buy this, don't buy this, you know, mm. or, you know, stop buying handbags. Blah, blah. Um, so it's quite a fine line to tread because I, you know, not buying X, Y, or Z is not going to make you wealthy, but to participate in the things that are going to make you wealthy, you there are certain spending behaviours that are congruent with that and some that aren't. And depending on your relationship with money, whether you're a spender or a saver, there is this sort of, Uh, you know, the celebrated ideal of being good with money. You know, you might go, my brother's really good with money or that friend is really good with money. Um, And when we think of those people, it's the people that like don't really buy things frivolously. They don't really spend emotionally and they've probably got a jacked up savings account. Mm. But I like looking at the other side of it as well. So I help people that spend, for want of a better term, too much, that want to free up money in their spending routine to participate in investing and wealth creation behaviours. But I also work on the other side where uh, there are other people that, may or may not struggle with the wealth creation stuff, but they're not getting any joy or lifestyle value from their money because they're nervous to spend it. And there's not a lot of attention on that because it's such a celebrated ideal of being good with money. Um, whereas actually a lot of people are like, oh my God, I'm <laughs> like, like no one's good with money. Nobody's good with money. Mm. There's no ideal. Um, and there's somewhere in the middle that both sides, I think, can meet. Um, and it's all very personal as well. So it's, there's a lot of, there's an element of self-development to it too, because when you know yourself better, you can manage your money better. Mm. I like that. It's interesting how many of us think that we should just be born knowing how to manage money and that everyone mm. else just magically knows how to manage money and mm. it's it's just something that should be innate where it's not. No, and it's not taught and it's very criticised that it's not taught in schools, but it's incredibly difficult to teach because you can teach, the, as we know, you can teach the numbers, but it doesn't necessarily go in because we're emotional. There's a lot of a lot of weight attached to money, so it's not a numerical thing. And it's also very difficult to teach children that don't have any lifestyle responsibilities. Um, even if you're teaching them with pocket money, it's not the same as when you've got to pay your mortgage and then a health bill comes up and then you've got to mm. decide if you can afford to have children. Like it's it's not the same. It's very, very difficult to pick the right time to teach it. Um, and when you're teaching in schools where there is a very, you know, the curriculum couldn't be standardised as it is with school material because you're working with people from completely different socioeconomic backgrounds, different money stories, um, different experiences at home, different uh, access to participation in money. Um, so it's, ve- it's very difficult. You can't, it's not like a standardized thing that can be taught. Mm. Um, and we absorb a lot of things at home as well that would complicate that if it were taught, but they also complicate things that it's not taught. Um, which, yeah, it makes it very hard. Everyone goes, we should learn this in school. That's the solution, but it's not. Um, 
unfortunately. Yeah. yeah. And speaking of learning about money, you've been studying a really interesting course overseas on financial psychology, if I'm not mistaken. Yes. I was wondering what the most interesting thing that's on your mind right now when it comes to this emerging area of behavioural finance, financial psychology, understanding the way we interact with money. Mm. It's been a really interesting time to study it with the cost of living crisis and inflation and economic difficulty because the kind of core theory of financial psychology is that throughout our lifetimes, it starts when we're very young and it, you know, it continues, we amass a series of financial flashpoints, which are certain key memories of money. Those flashpoints uh, then sort of sit in our subconscious and there's a million ways we can feel about that. Sometimes it's a really good thing. Sometimes it's a really bad thing. Sometimes there are a million other emotions involved. Um, and then when in our lives we're confronted with something that reminds us of that experience overtly or covertly, consciously or subconsciously, it can bring up a whole bunch of stuff which may not be rational to the situation. So when you look at the cost of living crisis, depending on what generation you're from, I'm 31, so I was sort of coming of age. I don't quite know what age that means, but I was sort of you know, 16, 17, 18 during the GFC. And at that time, I was brought up by a single mum. My mum got made redundant I think four times in two years, all centred mm. around that. In the UK, we called it the credit crunch. Um, and it was quite a tumultuous time in the economy. I know it wasn't quite as severe in Australia from what I've heard. Um, but, you know, we have the news. We know what's going around the world. We know when there's recession um, conversations. But it's been interesting for me kind of looking at that through how this landscape is bringing up a lot of old stuff for other people, maybe, maybe unconsciously, maybe they're not fully aware of that. Um, but it can make you feel some kind of way about something that's happening in front of you, even if that might not be rational. And an example of that is, you know, there's a lot of people very, very scared about the cost of living crisis when they're actually going to be fine. Um, but there are a lot of emotions that are coming up because when you look at it more broadly and you've got a lot of stuff sort of stirred up, you, you, there's, there might be something, there might be some language, there might be some feelings, there might be some media commentary that stirred up something from you or a narrative you were told, you know, you, if you've got parents that have lived through um, difficult periods in the economy or grandparents or, you know, it's, it's all generational, we, we pass it through. Um, that's been very interesting in terms of the cost of living because there is so much fear and some of it's logical and founded and there are many changes that need to be made. It's also systemic. So there's not necessarily, that for some people, there's a lot of things that, you know, it's, it's not personal responsibility. Um, but it's just been very interesting to observe people's emotions around it um, because we're, we're not being necessarily rational as no, emotions aren't rational. And I think that flashpoint and that, that sort of lifetime financial experience comes into play when we're dealing with the way we feel about a potential recession. Mm. I um, I often hear people talk about in, in investing, in what, the context of investing in particular, more like stock investing. Mm. They talk about this idea called like anchoring bias where you might anchor on like, I wait till the shares get to $5 mm. instead of $5.05 or something like this. And then you miss the shares or something, I don't know. But I was introduced to this concept of anchoring bias uh, in the lifestyle context as well um, by my psychologist actually she said like imagine your partner comes home she's upset um, and she walks through the door and she's really emotional and you've had a long day well in the future someone walking through that same door you may have not knowingly uh, like anchored something to that someone walking through the door mm. so then the next person that comes through maybe they're really happy but you still have an association you don't even realize mm. and you mentioned like cost of living is so important right now and I'm curious like how can people maybe be aware of this type of thing, these flashpoints that you mentioned, and mm. how can they think like a bit more clearly, I guess, or just be more introspective? Mm. I think that it pays a lot to think about what money was like for you growing up. And it's it's a it's a basic question that a lot of people say, and a lot of people go, oh, we've included mindset questions in our course, program, journal, whatever. And it's yep. like, what were your parents like with money? And you can answer that quite surface level. They were this, they were that. Uh, but when you get a lot more curious about what that was like, think about what some of your major money memories may have been. Or money memories is hard because people get very literal about it. Just big things that have happened in your life. Like, for example, uh, marital breakdown of parents. Um, or a lot of people who've got self-employed parents experience mm. this real belief that you've got to work really, really hard and it's such a struggle. And a lot of those people go on to be... Um, 
very, very frugal because they think that earning money is really, really difficult. Um, I think just getting curious about what the, the role that money played in your upbringing, any of those key sort of moments, but also then in real time, because it's easier to think about the now, like I have a very patchy memory um, of certain parts of my childhood. But thinking about now, you know, you go to the supermarket and things are more expensive. I recently went off on a rant about the yogurt I wanted to buy. I thought it was going to be $6. It was eight thirty, And I was like, but that that rage that even just presented itself there, it's two bucks. Like, have I got the two bucks? Yes. If I didn't have the two bucks, it's yogurt. Like, life goes on. It's not about the yogurt. Mm. There's something mm. else there about that very sort of primal threat to our needs being further out of reach or particularly when it's mm. the basic needs. You know, the rental crisis, like what role is housing played for you? I talked about this recently at a, a first home buyers event, um, talking about how confronting it was for me to buy an apartment with my partner when my parents have got five marriages between them, four of which have failed. <laughs> um, thinking it, there was a lot of emotional weight mm. on that kind of thing. And it's very easy to just not think about it and kind of go, oh no, you know, it will be different for me or this or, or this or that. But I think there is value in knowing why you may think the way you think because when you're looking at the facts of, you know, money in your savings account doesn't outpace inflation, that might be factually true, but you also need to do what is emotionally safe and psychologically safe for you to do. Your own circumstances and your own financial experience and your own financial psychology is going to play a significant role in deciding what financial security and what decisions are okay for you. I talk about this often with one of my friends, Tash, who's been mm. on the show. She's got a much higher risk profile, profile than me because her financial psychology is completely different. Um, there might be some literal factors to that too, but a lot of it comes down to she's not scared of the same things that I'm scared of. Um, and so we behave differently with money, even though the, the facts remain true. And you could give us the exact same income and the exact same financial circumstances and we would behave differently because what's psychologically safe for me is not what's psychologically safe for her. Um, yeah, mm. does that answer your question? I yeah. think it does. <laughs> yeah, no, it does. You know, really interesting, like you said, emotionally safe. Mm. I think a lot of, that's the kind of key phrase mm. that people don't really think about with money. Mm. We talk about being reasonable rather than rational, but... Mm. Um, like emotionally safe, a lot of people could relate to that. Like mm. a, especially around the investing piece, people mm. who are like, you know, I can't invest this one hundred dollars. I'll save it instead. That's safer for me, even mm. though we know all the data says you should invest for the long term. Mm. Right? Like so many people can relate to that. So that's totally fair. Mm. Um, one thing that we talk about a lot is like having conversations with people, uh, and particularly kind of like the social, I guess, proof of like. A lot of people need to feel like they need to prove themselves or like have money or go along with things like peer pressure and all that sort of stuff. But yeah, we know the connection with family and friends is so important. Mm. So how does, how, I guess, in terms of like maybe practical examples or even just generally speaking, how people can maybe think about still having those relationships, still building those relationships while being conscious of their budget in this time? Mm. It's connection and paying for connection is quite interesting because connection is as important if not more so than it's always been for society for mental health for well-being um but i mean i think people can probably relate to this i think that we've got into the habit of that kind of belief that everything costs money and it you know it in a way it does like we're sitting here now in an office that you pay for with microphones that you've paid for i paid to get the train here da 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 but I think, you know, if anybody kind of goes out for dinner with groups of friends or whatever, it's very easy for your default every time you're going to catch up with someone or particularly people you maybe don't see that often and you see them once a month or once a quarter or once a year. It's very easy to go, uh, do you want to catch up on Friday? Yeah, um, wh where are we going? Where are we going to pay for dinner and drinks? And you don't necessarily think about it, um, which is, you know, fine when <laughs> the economy is pretty stable. But if we're in a different, if we're working with different financial circumstances, which most of us are, I think most people's costs have gone up in some way, whether you've got a mortgage or rent or whatever. Um, sometimes you need to make different financial decisions based on that. And I think just thinking about ways you can connect, I think we often think about the experience and then the connection is a byproduct of that. Um, whereas if we think about, I want to connect with this person, I want to see my family and friends, I want to do X, Y, and Z, and then kind of flipping it a bit thinking more about the value of the connection like how do I want to connect with this person do I want to spend an evening with them do I want to go for a walk with them do I want to see them for a weekend um it's a bit, it's a bit of a convoluted way of saying it but I think mm. we often think about the experience which generally costs money mm. before we think about the connection whereas going connection first and then working with 
maybe your own circumstances. Particularly, I've said this on social media recently, and you know, it's it's difficult to word it in a way that feels right. But I think if you're doing okay-ish with money at the moment, it's helpful to bring up those conversations. You know, oh, do we do we want to do dinner, or do you want to just come over, or what about we go and have some dumplings instead of going to uh, Embla or something? I'm trying to think of a nice restaurant. <laughs> so long as I've been to one. <laughs> Cost of living. Chin chins uh, downstairs. Yeah. Yeah. Because yeah, it's a chin chin. Um, you know, you can have a, the same connection experience, mm. even if the chandeliers aren't as nice. Um, or even if you, and this is a really silly example, but if you have a glass of wine instead of a cocktail, like, I mean, or I've stopped drinking, but whatever. A cocktail is like 25 bucks now. Yeah, it's okay. Glass of wine or happier can be eight bucks. Yeah. Like, you're having the exact same experience. And even going, this is you know off topic a bit, but I've recently massively cut down on drinking, and this is sort of a metaphor of what I'm saying. But I've the the reason I was able to do it is I started having non-alcoholic drinks and I was out at restaurants or with friends, and what I realised was I've had the exact same experience with a different thing, and the same goes for money. Whether you go out for a coffee instead of brunch, if you go out for dessert instead of dinner, if they come to your house instead of going out, the connection is the same, if not better. <laughs> And you haven't paid as much for it. Um, so, yeah, does that help? Yeah, I resonate <laughs> yeah. with that because mm. that's something I've been doing more recently of having meals and coffees mm. at my place or at friends' places mm. because you're still getting that connection and it mm. almost feels a bit better because it's more personal because they've tidied up, mm. they've put out their best cups mm. or whatever, they've got and milk and their, their food home. and stuff you're like that. You're in their space yeah. and mm. it's sort of like a generational joke that like millennials hate people coming over and trust me I can do do not ever turn up at my house unannounced I <laughs> cannot right, stand we'll keep it that in mind. Mm. <laughs> but it's in a way I want to break that down like I think it's become a a kind of punchline that we have these walls up but it's actually not doing our mental health any good um so yeah go to people's houses if you can or or even just more on the monetary side like a coffee and a pastry might be 15 bucks brunch would probably be like 40 um you can have the same experience yeah the same connection even like local parks like recently yeah. on the public holiday just walking around some of the local parks seeing so many family and friend groups mm. having picnics or coffees or just exploring the local areas that mm. was really nice and i'm sure they probably had a bit of ex- better experience than if they just sat down mm. at a coffee shop and had a coffee mm. and it's a lot more like thinking psychologically it's a lot less scarce to think, okay, things are getting more expensive. I need to make some changes. Our default is to go all or nothing. I can't go out for dinner. No takeaway. No you know. social activities yeah, whatsoever. Nothing. Sorry, I can't see you. You've got no money. And it's like, it costs nothing to have a conversation. Um, but you can have, yeah, you can spend less money doing the same mm. things that you already do. And it will translate to your budget. Um, and that, like, that's the best way. Like I call it low sacrifice, high impact changes. Um, you're not sacrificing the experience particularly, but the impact to your budget is noticeable. Mm. Yeah, that's really interesting. And I know recently in your newsletter, you wrote about the idea of money rules. And one I wrote down was like the idea of never ordering a second drink at a restaurant or for you, it was never pay for parking. And it's those things at the back of the mind that we always go, these are my my rules. Maybe I don't subquent, like talk about them out loud, but they're at the back there. And I was interested to hear your perspective on this idea of money rules and how that plays into the way we manage our money and maybe manage our relationships with other people as well Mm, yeah it's it's funny i can the second drink one i can vividly remember my mum and i had gone out with um like one of her friends and her daughter when i was probably oh we must have been older because i think we were drinking anyway i remember afterwards we got in the car my mum was like did you see lucy order another gin and tonic and i was like oh (laughs) like i i noticed it she's like i couldn't believe it (laughs) i was like (laughs) <laughs> okay like all right but because for us like you don't do that like yeah. you you don't have a second drink you don't i used to I, i've always wanted to be more of a beachy person and i go i can't go to the beach because the parking's so expensive and it's like yeah it's expensive for parking but if it's 20 bucks for the day like can i afford that or not like maybe no but Often it's not the money it's a bit like the yogurt thing it's it was 2 bucks but i spiraled into a red hot ball of rage in coals about it um when it it's the meaning that we put onto what it is that we're doing um and you might kind of think i can't have x y z i can't because you're not the person like you didn't grow up with the identity that you could have a second drink or that you could pay for parking um but actually when you 
do those things, or it might be another one common one is the buying the cheapest thing in the supermarket or getting the best deal. I think I talked about it in that newsletter. I actually do not know how to book flights, accommodation, whatever, without days and days and days of number crunching. Is that cheaper? And I've got past it a bit because as you, know, as you get a bit more disposable income, you can book the flight that doesn't get in at like the bumhole hour of the morning when you land. With the 10 hour stopover. And you have the wherewithal to go, okay, but if I do that, I can get the train. Whereas if I do that, that's cheaper. I'm going to pay 200 bucks for an Uber or something. Um, but I still, I still won't just go, you know what? That's there. You know, a book on the hotel website, for example. I'm like pulling up all the tabs and getting all the cash back. <laughs> and in a way it's fun, but there's a lot of scarcity behind that because I cannot... If I find out I could have got a better deal, you, I'm cancelling and I'm rebooking. Really? And it's like, it's it kind of this idea of celebrated money ideals. People would go, well, that, she's really smart with her money. That's good. But is Did it you psychologically spend 20 worth hours it? finding it? Exactly. And I'm self-employed. So what else could I have been doing through that time? What mm. else could I have been thinking about when mm. I wasn't like having mental tabs open as well, thinking, oh, do I, oh, the, the, the bonus cashback's coming up. Like, I better wait. Like, what else could I have been thinking about? And is it psychologically and energetically worth it mm. for 25 bucks? But it feels like it is because it's very significant. You didn't get the best deal. Like, mm. You know, mm. um, I think it can be quite, we, we, they're seen as the things that we should do to be smart with money, but it's not necessarily as black and white as that. Mm. Yeah. Um, I think people who are watching could see the, the, the over your shoulder there, you've got the, the Pulse Money Journal. Oh, that? Yeah. <laughs> Just um, something I created earlier? Yeah, yeah. Uh, and one of the questions that we wanted to ask you is about accountability with goals and spending, mm. I try to journal every night and it's just like, I notice when I don't do it, like when I miss it for a few mm. days, it really, it's like I take some things into the next day, like mm. stress or whatever into the next day. So that's kind of like a gate that kind of shuts the door or whatever you want to th analogy. Uh, and then I start the new day afresh. Uh, how can we do that with our spending? So spending is a really interesting one because often focuses on spending are only really aimed at people that are spending beyond their means or, or spending right up to their means um, and they need to cut it out. And that is obviously the, the key benefit of cleaning up your spending habits um, is freeing up money for other things. Mm. Um, but what the journal really does is it prompts you to, it's a, it's a weekly thing. It's not something we do daily, it's something we do every week. And it's just a very simple, I made the, I made the review process deliberately simple because I find I like journals with all the whizzy features but I also don't use them um, I buy them the more features the better like getting the value you know um, but I wanted to make it usable for someone yeah. with a brain like me so it is just a weekly spread but what it does and what it aims to do is gets you to sit with that concept of the financial experience but in real time so how did how did you feel about money this week that's we don't really think about that we go what did I spend oh oh god it's either good or it's bad and we don't really go further than that. It's either within the numbers or it's not. Um, but when you think about how you felt, you can start to farm that data and look for patterns. Because the next question after that is, is there anything out of the ordinary this week? Mm. Uh, did you have a really stressful week at work? Uh, were you experiencing some mental health challenges? Uh, were you on your period <laughs> if you menstruate? Like all these things come into it. Um, and so we kind of look at that. Then we look at the transactions, but the numbers aren't really relevant. It's about ranking out mm. of 10 how much each transaction added to your life. Obviously, the needs and the essentials, you know, rent, <laughs> not that much joy, but it's got to be paid. But I mean, in a way, that's kind of a whole well, other conversation. If you had some people over for a exactly. dinner party, yeah. maybe you got some joy. Exactly. Um, but yeah, from a discretionary sense, often we kind of go, oh, I was in budget this week. But what, did any of those things add to your life? Were you in budget, but you're actually having a really stressful week? And so you kind of mindlessly paid for a bunch of stuff and you... You know, forgot to get you need to return that thing but you probably won't because you lost the receipt and do you know what I mean it's very you can often be numerically on paper fine but you're not getting much value from your money and over time that really compounds into a negative relationship with money and it's why you hear people going I've got no money when you're looking at the lifestyle going yes you do it's why there are people that are in the middle upper middle upper class category struggling with the cost of living because as your lifestyle you know taking lifestyle group out of it the more money you have often you will pay for certain lifestyle things or higher mortgage or whatever but where your money's going and the decisions you're making they're either making you feel good or they're not and if mm. you're continually on paper fine not spending above your means but you're buying things that aren't adding to your life you're going to 
feel like it's not all worth it's all not worth it you know you kind of go well, what's the point and oh well, I haven't got any money either when you actually earn five times what the person you're talking to and then they feel funny about that and and you don't feel good about that um because you're not getting the value from your money so that's really what the journal aims to do then there is a um somewhat of a strategic part where we look ahead to the following week and look for sort of things that might be coming up because you know people do this all the time I do this all the time you look ahead and you make a plan and then you go oh it's my friend's birthday oops and you haven't thought it through yeah um but the, mm. the psychological benefit to that is you go, oh, it's my friend's birthday or oh, it's this or oh, it's our anniversary or oh, we said we were going to have dinner out or whatever. And then you feel bad about it and you've got to, you've got to make changes to your budget in real time because you forgot about it and you don't enjoy it as much because you've seen it as like a blunder. You're punishing yourself. It's ruining the plan you made. Whereas if you go in planning it, like it, you could even do this as, as a tester, plan to go out for dinner next week and see how much you enjoy it. And then try and decide to have dinner in real time on the day and see how much you enjoy it. Like, it, it's a very different experience because you've allowed for that and you've got the permission for that. There's a huge permission piece in the shame and the guilt aspect of money. Um, and yeah, it's just, it's just maximizing the money that you have got because we all think that more money will help. And to some degree, it does in a logistical sense, but psychologically, you still need to get the value out of the money you've got, whether you're spending $100 or 100000 can I just double click on something there? You mentioned like if you look forward, which is a really important point, I think. Um, you mentioned it's kind of like you give yourself that opportunity to think about it in mm. advance. Why do you think that works? Like what do you think actually makes it work for people? I think it's about making decisions based on what you know about yourself. Um Another sort of example of that is often we go, and in a way, those ideals about what being good with money means. Um, an example, you've got a staff party uh, or after work drinks or whatever, and you go, uh, you, you know, previously you've gone, I've really got to stop uh, spending money on getting Ubers home. I'm going to get the train. <clears throat> the time comes, you have drinks, you miss your last train because you're having a really good time. Then you go home and you wake up in the morning and go, oh, I got that Uber. I should have got the train. Like mm. you're really berating yourself for it. And suddenly the fun you had and the experience you had has been eclipsed by this like, oh, I shouldn't have done that. Mm. Whereas when you're looking ahead, if you if you know yourself, like this is why I always say getting to know yourself and know your habits and know your tendencies is an act of financial empowerment. Because if you know, I mean, maybe this is a bad example, but if you know that you don't make the train because you're, you've had a couple of wines, you're chatting away and you're going, oh, I don't want to leave. Oh, I'll just get an Uber and then you feel bad about it the next day. If you know you get an Uber, build that in if, if you're able to um, and ju just let it happen. Like if you know that, you know, people always go, I've got to stop getting takeaway. So then they have these miserable Friday nights when they just want to be having the takeaway. If you know that that's what you want to do and that's what you're going to want to do, try and find a way to fit that in because... The psychological benefit of allowing yourself to have what you know that you instinctively want is going to make you like the collateral benefit is you're going to spend less money in other areas because you don't feel deprived. A lot of our behavior is like retaliation, um, whether it's retaliation mm. from an experience we had growing up. You know, I couldn't have that, so I buy it now um, or I was never allowed to do that, so I do it now. Um or it's retaliation, you know, with ourselves. It's, it's why when you go, I'm going to get up at six and go to the gym every day. On day five, you sleep until ten, and you're, you're going. Well, you know, if I just if I just plan for that, if I just average that out, or always becoming a morning person. I've been. Everyone tries to become a morning person. Everyone tries to become a runner. But if you don't <laughs> like running, <laughs> and you don't like getting up in the morning, you don't perform well in the morning. Why are we trying to do it? You know. So really working with what you know feels good to you. And that's kind of where the journal comes in because you don't necessarily know what feels good. You mm. have to really become aware of every financial decision you make and how emotionally safe and psychologically safe it feels for you and do more of those and less of the others. I love how you approach money and spending as one big experiment where <laughs> everything you do, you can learn from. Mm. If you make the impulse decision, if you make the plan decision, you can learn from both of that mm. those experiences. And I know you've been talking a lot this year about no spending challenges and things along those lines. Mm. Are you able to talk a little bit more about what that looks like for you and maybe how you've approached that? Mm, I love the no spend conversation because it's such a debate and I love the debate because I completely see the, the argument on both sides. Yeah. So there's... 
you know, for anyone that's not you know, fully aware, the no spend challenge is it, it's kind of coming around again on TikTok. It started in the debt free community sort of on the earlier days of social media. It's coming around again on TikTok. People are doing a no spend challenge or no spend day where, you know, for a defined period of time, you don't spend any money outside of what you need. There's also the category ban, which I'll kind of come on to. Um, I used to be quite anti no spend day because I kind of drank the Kool-Aid of like, no, just, you know, set a reasonable budget you can stick to and a bit like a, you know, uh, likening it to a fad diet. Um, it doesn't last long term. You know, the money you save, you'll just spend again later. Um, but the more I've sort of delved into financial psychology and really spent more time working with the emotions around money, I am much more pro the no spend challenge under certain circumstances. And the way I differentiate between a a good no spend challenge for want of a better term and a bad no spend challenge is if it is reactive or responsive. Mm. So if your no spend challenge is reactive and you've got, oh God, and you're berating yourself, I've spent so much money, I'm not spending any money this week. And you haven't looked ahead to see if it's your friend's birthday and you haven't thought about what you're aiming to achieve and you're just Mm. kind of like putting yourself into tension, that's reactive. And you're not going to get much benefit from that because, yes, you probably will retaliate afterwards. It will probably impact your relationship with money in a negative way. You're not really going to save a significant amount of money that will change your life, nor are you going to rehearse a range of habits that are going to benefit you long term. If it's responsive and you've gone, God, last week was a bit you know, nuts at work and I <laughs> had Uber Eats five nights and got an Uber to and from work. X amount of times and sorry, big plug for Uber there. Uh, <laughs> are that you know maybe you uh, did some online orders and oh god, it was that um, you know afterpay day or mm. Vogue online shopping night or whatever. Oh, I did X, Y, and Z, and you've gone okay. What was happening there? Okay, I was really stressed at work and it's really busy. I'm going to be busy again this week. You know what I'm going to do? I'm going to do X, Y, and Z so that I don't do X, Y, and Z. Or you might go. You know what? I know I've got a really big big sort of, again, for want of a better word, problem. I've got a really big tendency to do this. For me, it's buying clothes. Love buying clothes. Did a lot of work on this earlier in my financial journey. Then lockdown just dragged it all up again. And uh, it's been quite a slow realisation, but I've had to accept this year. Um, And a response to that is, I'm not going to buy clothes for an entire year. An entire year, I, I would recommend it to a lot of people. Have I partly made it a year because I can tie it to my work and there's a lot to say around this? Yes, I'm sort of doing an experiment for other people. Um, But, you know, I recommend anybody doing it for any period of time. But that is responsive to a problem. And so there's the responsive part, but also looking at what you're going to do in the no spend period or the category ban period. If you're just going to shut your eyes and try and get through it and go, I did it. Where's my reward? And then next week, go and spend all the money you didn't spend that's not really worth it. You're just going to cause yourself psychological harm for no reason, emotional harm for no reason. Whereas if you're kind of going, okay, this is a bit like we said, this is a situation that I know I have a tendency for and it's not serving me. I would like to free up that. I did a podcast with someone who said they'd spent $10,000 on clothing last year. Looking at that, you know, I'd like to free up that money to travel. You might go, okay, well, I'm going to do this ban because what that's going to do is it's going to allow me to notice when I want to buy things. I am going to, like something I'm doing on this um, year of no clothing buying, as I'm going into clothing stores, seeing things I like and actually activating that, like, oh my God, that's so nice, I want to buy that. And walking away from that. Hmm. Because the more you do, like anything, it's like a muscle you'll build up. The more you <laughs> climb up and down the stairs, we are talking <laughs> off air of how hard it is to go up and down the stairs. The more you do that, the fitter you're going to get. The more you practice the habits that are existing in the no spend container, if if it's if you're doing it in a way that is going to teach you something in the future, I'm all for it. Um, And I think that it can be, it massively depends. This is where knowing yourself helps because it really depends on your personality. Some people aren't all or nothing people, so they're not going to get anything out of it. Um, But if you are, you probably will notice a lot. If if nothing Mm. else, you'll notice where those impulses are coming from, the circumstances around them. You know, I used to um, work in London and because I liked to, I didn't know anyone in the city when I moved there and I liked to go around for walks at night, but obviously I'm a woman who can't walk around in the dark at night in London, (laughs) in West London. So I used to go to Westfield because I could do laps and listen to my music and whatever, but I'm in a shopping centre and I like buying clothes. So I would buy stuff, like just on my, I would go there because I liked it there. I like, it was safe for me there. Like it was light, I get there open till like midnight. I could walk around late. Um... But that was an that was like a circumstantial thing for me that I kept going back into that experience and being like, why do I have no money? Because 
Mm. That was like a habitual thing. Then there's the emotional thing. I would also go and buy clothes. Mm. When I felt crap about my um, appearance, I would go and that would be another thing. And when you notice those things, you can make the tweaks when you're done with the challenge or throughout the challenge that make something that was at first quite a... Uh, what's the word, quite the opposite of your behavior, you can start to weave it into a, a way that kind of works for the way that you live your life. Mm. Um, so I think to do it, to, to summarize, I think to decide whether a no spend is right for you, think about what you plan to get out of it other than, you know, just saying, didn't spend any money this week. Cool. If you're going to spend double next week, doesn't help you. And what is the data you're trying to farm? It has to be, there has to be something that you can work with mm. going forward because a week of anything is not going to change your life. But if you learn something in that week, that might mm. change your life. Yeah, it's so putting a goal and a framework mm. around it. Mm. Yeah, it's really interesting. I like it. Uh, there are a couple more questions we have here. Mm. The one, the first one is like this idea around financial comparison. Mm. Um, and there are so many quotes about envy and these types of things. But someone that gets caught in that trap of like comparing themselves to others, how do you think about untangling that, I guess? Mm. Comparison in the 2020s is huge. Um, mm. And I've been thinking about this recently because I saw somebody put a post up the other day, and it's something that's quite discussed in modern personal finance, that, you know, I, I think it was something along, along the lines of, I don't care about the Joneses, you know, the concept of keeping up with the Joneses. And I think a lot of our parents' generation did that. I know that that was a big thing in the lower middle class pocket of a small town in the UK. Keeping up with everything was always about, you, you'd see someone about and they go, oh, they've got a new car. How have they got that? There's the comparison. Oh, we're going to get a new car to keep up with that. And I think our generation is not necessarily keeping up with the Joneses, but we're comparing ourselves to the Joneses. And we have access to millions of Joneses every day because of social media. And the psychological concept of relative deprivation is that you are more likely to measure your circumstances based on a reference group. And that's kind of where the keeping up with the Joneses comes from. You know, you're comparing your satisfaction based on the conditions of people around you. So if they've got something, it's also used a lot in um, sort of social justice work, like the concept of relative deprivation in terms of um, uh, access to opportunities for racial minorities, for example. Like it's, people might go, but you're fine, you've got this, but relatively to the reference group, it, there is deprivation. So the same thing applies um, to comparison in all senses, particularly financial. We can see, particularly with people talking about the money stuff online, uh, we can see other people's situations in a silo of no other knowing of them, which is kind of the way that it's always worked with the keeping up with the Joneses. So I think that it's, you know, knowing that that's where it's coming from. Awareness is the first kind of step to everything. Knowing that your reference group is wider than it's ever been. Thinking about what that reference group is, maybe auditing it a little bit if there are people that are making you feel bad. I mean, I get it too. I'm in the personal finance space and I'm probably the brokest person in the personal finance space because a lot of my peers are online talking about their six-figure, multiple six-figure net worths, and they're five, six, seven, eight, nine years younger than me. And I'm here going, <laughs> got 15K invested, <laughs> mm. be like me. You know, it's it, it, there's relative deprivation mm. everywhere. There is comparison everywhere. Noticing the circumstances around who you're comparing to is the first thing. Auditing who you're comparing yourself to is the, is the second thing kind of accepting that we are going to compare ourselves like I, I you can give tips to the ends of the earth but it's very human to reference your progress your success your happiness around what other people are doing so that auditing helps because you're comparing against things that are realistic um but actually having i think the the greatest antidote to comparison is having a path for yourself um so that you can compare against where you were to where you are now. Um, there's caveats to that because what that can do then is have you feeling bad if you're worse, you know, life isn't linear, finances yeah. aren't linear. Um, but I think that regardless, it helps if you know what your next two, three, four, five, six steps are, whether that's paying off debt, whether that's making a net worth to 500,000. If you know what's next for you, it's kind of, again, that, that rehearsal thing. When you see yourself comparing to other people, you have to intercept that thought and that feeling and put yourself in a different environment. So is that journaling? Is that looking at your goals? Is it visualization? I've actually really had to pull my head out of my backside on visualization because I thought it was super woo-woo. 
Um, but in financial psychology, there's a lot of science behind it. it well, in all psychology, there's a lot of science behind it. And um, I've started working with it a lot more. Um, and it's very powerful in terms of cutting out that noise of comparison and recentering yourself on what you're doing for you. And, and there's that you thing again. There's that knowing yourself. Because when you don't know what you want, you see, I use this example a lot. I used to think I wanted uh, designer handbags. It was only because I couldn't have them. And I saw other people that had them. And then when I sort of started thinking, yeah, that's what I want and working towards it, it wasn't what I wanted at all. And now I work out what I do, what, what my values really are. I talk about financial values an awful, awful lot. Now I know what I want money for and what I want in my life. I don't compare myself to the people doing other things. Like travel is a big one. I like holidays and I love hotels. I'm not going to backpack the world because I just, I can't do it. Like <laughs> it's, it's hard work. It's, yeah, it's not for me. But for so long, I compared myself going, oh God, I've got, to, I've got to save up so much money so I can go to 50 countries in a year. I don't want to do that. And so now I see people doing that and I love that for them. If that's what they want to do, that's amazing. But it's not what I want to do. So having a path for yourself and knowing what you actually want, not what you've been socialized to want, can be quite helpful. Mm. That's where the journal helps. Mm. Sometimes you it know helps yourself. to experience it on a small level, mm. But mm. to know that that's something you want or mm, you don't want. Exactly. Otherwise, you're always just like, oh, yeah, that's what I want without mm. really evaluating that idea. Yeah. Well, my um, on my website, I have a financial values workbook, which you can download for free if you sign up for <laughs> a newsletter. Um, shameless plug there. But in that, what I get people to do is to look at, to write about, um, you know, if it were verbal, I'd say, tell me about that. But I get people to write about uh, some of the best things they've ever spent money on, whether it's a thing, you know, people always go, it's experiences over things. It's not necessarily, it can be a thing. And you can learn from a thing, even if you farm that to use money on experiences. But when you think about the best things you've ever spent money on and draw similarities in those things, certain words start to come up over and over again. For some people, it's like adventure, expansion, exploring. And I'm like, <laughs> being at home, <laughs> warmth, calm, um, <laughs> ease. They're my financial values, yeah. which is why I will spend money on um, staying overnight in the city if I've got two events in the morning. Like some people will go, why would you spend $200 on that? I'd rather that because it makes my life so much easier. Some people would rather get a $200 scoot flight to Thailand. I wouldn't. But that's what they want and that's what, I, you know, when you know what your values are, you can spend your money in a way that works for you. Mm. All right, Emma, now putting your financial values to the test, if I handed you $1,000 right now, mm -hmm. I have not touched $1,000 in cash for a long time, but <laughs> leave that aside, to spend in the next 24 hours, you have to ha spend it all on something that is going to increase your overall happiness levels, mm -hmm. what would it be? Okay, so... You might th think that this is cheating, but I think that the answer will make enough sense that you'll allow me to do it. Okay. So what I would do, $1,000. There's a bunch of new hotels that have opened in Melbourne and I've been tracking their openings online and I'm <laughs> dying to go. So I would spend $500 of it booking two nights at two different hotels for different times and I would probably make them after football games because nothing ruins my evening more than getting the train home after I've been at Marvel. I hate it. I can't stand it. So I would that would be like a double value there. I love hotels. I love beautiful things. I love seeing new hotels. I love seeing the lobby bar. I love it. So I would do that, try those two, and maximise the um, the ease of not having to get the train home after the football and having a day in the city after. Woo, all fun. And then the other $500, I would load it into my Uber such Uber Eats account because I've got a really, really busy couple of months with some projects I'm working on. And I keep I keep getting caught out in that. I get in that state and I'm uh, in that state of like, okay, it's seven o'clock, I need to eat, but I need to do another hour of work. Yes, in a way I'm justifying it to myself, you know, oh, if I order this food, I can get another hour of work done. But that keeps coming up for me. Mm. So instead of going you're terrible, you're getting takeaway. I've had this real realisation recently that I've decided that getting takeaway, somewhere along the line, I've developed this belief that getting takeaway is like failing at life when actually it's sometimes it's just really helpful. Um, or when I'm out and about or I've got meetings and I don't have time to get lunch in the day. So I would load the other 500 onto my Uber slash Uber Eats account so that if I need to, you know, bounce to my haircut after this podcast recording, I can jump in an Uber rather than going, again, I do it, we do it with Ubers and trains. Getting an Uber is failing. You must be late. You must be like overspending. You've got to get the train. The aim is to get the train and the Uber's the backup. Whereas actually sometimes if you just go, you know what? I'm going to need to get Uber Eats three times a week for the next month. How much is that going to cost me? 
probably 500 bucks, maybe. It's pretty expensive now. <laughs> um, mm. I would do that because that would speak to my ease and my um, kind of calm and value and services, making things easier for myself. Mm. A very in touch with your values mm. answer. I think yeah. it's a, a good one if, if you're listening right now. Try asking one of your friends or family members this question mm. in the next 24 hours and see what they say. You yeah. might learn a lot about them. And I always say, um, tr- like, don't, you know, people go, what would you spend um a thousand bucks on and they might go, oh, I put it in my savings. Or, you know, you can't do that. Yeah, you have to spend it. But imagine you've got to like, don't actually do it unless you really want to, but imagine you've got to like make a PowerPoint presentation and make a case. You've got to convince the jury <laughs> how it added to your life because mm. it makes you kind of go, no, 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 hear me out, hear me out. This is why. Mm. And you actually learn a lot from what you say to that question. Yeah, cool. Um, it's been heaps of fun, Emma. It always is. I'm just sitting back listening and learning. Um, if you wanted to leave our audience with something, how you know behavioral uh, finance episodes are often our most popular mm. um what would you leave them with mm. other I... than the journal which they can go and they can purchase <laughs> you can purchase in the first week of each month uh, because i had to reduce the labor of packing like <laughs> one order every eight days like dragging it all out of my wardrobe so they are available for the first week of each month cool. um, and then the sales are closed um what would i leave people with this is probably a cop out, but I would leave people with that question. I think if you hadn't asked me that, I would have said something to that effect. Um, yeah, start thinking about your financial values. Start with that question. If you're curious about more, download the the guide, the free guide on my website, um, because I think it's a really great place to start. Uh, you start. It gives you a reference point for all of your purchases, and you start thinking, oh, is that? Is that my values? Like, is that adding to my life? And it's not something you do one and done. Um, they're going to change over time. Like, mine are very in your 30s. <laughs> Were they my values now I was 20? Probably not. Um, yeah. Mm. That's great. Amazing. Well, I, like it. I would really encourage everyone to check out Emma's podcast, The Broke Generation. It's one of the few I listen to on a regular basis. Mm-hmm. It's fantastic. Mm. And your Instagram. Yes. You're there a lot. Yes. I, I, I'm very occasionally on TikTok as well, but I wouldn't wait because I don't like it there. <laughs> TikTok's it. Yeah. Um, well, it's been heaps of fun. So thank you for <laughs> taking the train in and joining us. Really appreciate it. Thank you for having me. I love coming on the show. Good. And Kate, as always, thanks for joining me. Thanks for listening, everyone. <laughs>